As you read the whole Bible, there are periods when there are no kings at all in the Old Testament. There are judges, right? And uh, when they came to the New Testament, they began to look at the government of congregations, and they began to notice that churches apparently had a plurality of leaders and not a single uh, leader. Um, the whole notion of presbyters and elders uh, got them to thinking, and then they began to notice that a lot of the kings in the Bible sort of get it uh, in a bad way. They aren't necessarily held up as uh, honorable, that they can even be executed. Uh, Milton goes to a passage and finds a prophet that tells the prophet, uh, the prophet tells a person to go kill somebody. Uh, in fact, uh, I think I dropped the name there, but, um, and, and apparently with the approval of God that a king could be executed. So, uh, and then they went to Acts 5 and Peter says, when he, they're told by the civil authorities to do X, Peter says, King's X here, you know, uh, we ought to obey God rather than man. And uh, so right or wrong, we can argue about how they interpret the Bible. What I'm saying, in fact, is the way they did interpret the Bible was to see it as the basis of, uh, of a, a greater, more uh, liberal society. And uh, Milton found most of his arguments uh, in the writings of the New Testament, St. Paul. There's a book out that came out several years ago called The Pauline Renaissance in England. And it's about how the Puritans made special and unique use of the Pauline letters when they were working through all of the issues of the 17th century around um, government and, and church government and civil government and so forth. Um, Galatians was called the Magna Carta of the Reformation. And, you can, and what, uh, uh, what Milton did is he just went through Paul over and over again and found passages that he thought permitted or allowed freedom. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Never mind, uh, someone might argue, well, that was a particular text and a particular moment in time, uh, and uh, Milton's proof texting or whatever. Uh, that is, in fact, what they did over and over and over again. And guess what? That all was done in the, in the 1640s, 1650s, a full hundred years before the American Revolution. In many ways, the American Revolution, the arguments for civil liberty, are just echoes of the English Civil War. It's the same arguments, just repeated in a different way. Uh, one uh, writer on this made the point that when the English Civil War occurred, they didn't have a, a body of documents uh, around, around civil discourse to, uh, to be the basis of argument. They didn't have Rousseau's uh, arguments. They didn't have Marx to uh, fund their revolution. What they had was the Bible. And so it became sort of the, uh, the source book for uh, political theory and political argument. It's what exactly happened. Um, I remember reading Rousseau years ago, and it's, he's famous for saying, all men are born, born free, but everywhere they are in chains. Well, guess what? Milton said long before Rousseau, all men naturally were born free. Give me the liberty to know, to utter, and to argue freely according to conscience above all liberties. No man or body of men in these times can be the infallible judges or determiners in matters of religion to any other men's consciences but their own. Now, this is the kind of language I think today you and I might just sort of yawn over. It's like we'd say, of course, unless, of course, you're in Iran or certain other countries around the world where this is not normative yet. But in, you do need to understand that in Milton's own day, this was highly dangerous thinking. Um, I think it's Christopher Hill who says that based on Milton's actions and words, uh, once the monarchy was restored, and it was, Milton could have been executed five times over for crimes and, um, and something like eight times, uh, eight, eight life sentences he could have received for the things he wrote based on the laws of the land at that time. And he did go to jail for a little while, uh, but he had some people who intervened and, and got him out of jail. Um, 
my argument here is that the strategy of appealing to scripture to justify freedom common to the English Revolution became normative in America. For example, Milton believed that native liberty and religion, as he says here, were inseparably knit together. But it's just like two sides of the same coin, beyond question. When uh, Alexis de, de Tocqueville comes to America in the 1830s and travels around, he says, the Americans combine notions of Christianity and of liberty so intimately in their minds that it is impossible to conceive of one without the other. Same idea, isn't it? Now, I'm, I don't think Americans generally got it from Milton. It's just that this was the thinking, this was the mindset of people reading uh, the Bible, and it just uh, continued. And I would say that even today, our ideas of human rights um, come from this as well. Um, on the one hand, when you read Genesis, that we are created in the image of God, it's easy to go from there and saying, if we're created in the image of God, then we have the same rights and privileges innately, naturally. Uh, it was an easy step for them to make. Um, 